This week on the Balanced Voice Podcast, Renya welcomes Tina Stanley, a San Antonio parent who was forced to turn into a fierce advocate after learning her middle school child was in a serious, inappropriate relationship with a teacher. Tina walks us through the severe trauma her child experienced and what she learned to demand from the district in order to make meaningful change. I grew up with a lot of respect for teachers and I demanded that my child had respect for teachers. And so I never in a million years thought that this person would do anything that was not in her best interest. It never crossed my mind. And so I tell parents, you have a right to know where your child is during the school day. You have a right to know if they're in class or if they're meeting with someone else, and you need to demand that. Not only did Tina turn tragedy into empowerment for her young daughter, she has since been influential in passing legislation protecting students in 16 states. In our time together, she shares evergreen tools that help parents navigate an array of school situations, including protecting children from bullying. We hope you enjoy this conversation with Tina Stanley. Without further ado, here's your host, Renya Mancarios. Welcome to the Balanced Voice Podcast. We're joined today by Tina Stanley, who visits us uh, from San Antonio, who's going to share a really personal and um, import, important story, circumstance that happened directly to her and her eighth grade daughter. Tina's daughter, um, was approached by a teacher and uh, lured into an inappropriate relationship, which really created the question for us, what do these situations look like? How often do they happen? What is a student and a parent to do? And and Tina really has become an expert in this area. So Tina, welcome. I appreciate it. You and I had a chance to visit um, not too long ago, and I was riveted as you sat and told me what happened to your very own daughter. Could you share her story. Sure. Um, When my daughter was in seventh grade, she started getting special privileges from a teacher at school. Um, She talked about him a little bit, um, but I didn't think much of it. Um, Eighth grade, we, his name started coming up in conversation more often. Um, He began pulling her out to do small group tutoring, um, which I thought, you know, how fabulous they're looking at a child who needs a little bit of extra help and they're providing it. Um, Little did I know that there was an inappropriate relationship that had been groomed and was in the grooming stages. Um, We then started seeing problems with my daughter with her behavior. Um, She started self-harming and cutting. And we instantly went, I mean, the day that she did it, we went to see a therapist to start trying to figure out what was going on. Um, It didn't come up and didn't come up and didn't come up. Um, Things happen during the school year that now that I look back on, I think how in the world did I miss that? Um, For instance, you know, this teacher would tell her, oh, you can stay after school and do tutoring with me. She would call me and I was like, no, um, I graduated from junior high. I can help you. You don't need to take a teacher's time to do this. Um, I was becoming very frustrated that I thought he was encouraging her to fool around in the classroom instead of be diligent and get her work done. And so I was very clear, no, this isn't happening. But she kept asking, he kept prompting. And stupidly, I I didn't think anything of it. I didn't step in. I didn't do anything. When she went to ninth grade, it was um, the week after Valentine's Day. And she was sitting in the hallway on her computer because I was the parent that didn't allow computers in bedrooms. And she wanted to go to the bathroom. And as she went, she hit something. And I saw an icon down at the bottom of the screen. And I clicked on it. And it was a Gmail account. And she wasn't allowed to have Gmail accounts that I didn't know about. And obviously, I didn't know about this one. And it was a conversation between her and a teacher. And this teacher was asking her personal things, um, asking when she was going to be 18, how things were going, said that he was I'm disappointed he didn't get to see her when he went to her school. So immediately I started asking questions and she blew up. I mean, she was, she was furious. And I told her that we were sending an email to him. We were letting him know that, you know what? I didn't think this was appropriate. It wasn't going to continue. If he wanted to talk to her or check in on her, that he was welcome to do so, but through me, that this was my phone number. This was my email address. He was welcome to contact me anytime but that he was not to contact her directly. And 
I found that there were a lot of things in the emails where you could see she was trying to get his attention and it just concerned me. Um, and so as I talked and she yelled and screamed, she then, you know, decided she was going to her room. Normally when she would do this, I let her go. I let her have her time. Um, for some reason, this time I picked up the phone. I called my go-to girlfriend and said, Hey, you know, do you think I'm overreacting? Do you think I'm, you know, looking at this in a bad light? And she's like, no, it's just weird. Why would he be doing that? And I said, I don't know. But instead of leaving her alone, luckily, I went in to find her. She wasn't in her room. She was in her bathroom. The bathroom door was closed and locked. Um, she didn't respond to me. I went through the bathroom door and my daughter was on the floor of the bathroom. She had cut her neck six different times. She had cut her arms. Um, there was blood everywhere. I know what I did only because I forgot my girlfriend was still in my ears hearing everything. She heard everything the whole time. Um, after I made sure she was okay, um, I got her to be more awake, threw her in my car because it was much faster and the bleeding I had gotten to stop, took her to the ER. Um, my girlfriend had her son call, let the ER know we were on the way and had her there in seven and a half minutes. And um, luckily she was okay. But while we were there in the waiting room, or not the waiting room, but in a, a stall, I guess, where they put you in the ER, I was telling the doctor what had happened, and a policeman was standing outside. And as I walked around the corner, he came up to me and he said, there's a lot more to this than you know. You need to call the police. You need to talk to the school. At that point, I was like, what are you, what are you talking about? There's a lot more. It didn't, I couldn't really process what he was saying. I was still trying to process what had happened. About four in the morning, I went home, um, showered. And as soon as the school opened that morning, I went to the school campus. I took the email address and the password and I gave it to the school principal. And I said, listen, I don't know if there's anything here. I'm not in this mindset to process what's going on, but this is what's happened. I think my daughter's response is kind of odd. Um, would you look into it? And so you gave the school, you gave the school, I'm sorry, you gave the school her Gmail account and password. Yes. So that they could see everything themselves. Um, and they could see how the correspondence came in and out. And the principal pulled that teacher into the office before I left campus that day and no longer allowed him around children. He called the district principal, the principal called the district HR folks. They called me, had me come in for an interview. We sat and talked. Um, at that point, my daughter was in a mental health facility and they asked me some questions that led me um, to start looking for some other journals that my daughter had. Because one of the questions they asked was, you know, have you, do you know of this man? And I said, yeah, you know, I've talked to him and I've even let him know my daughter, you know, had a little crush on him um, that said, how do you know? And I said, because I'm that nosy mom that reads reads her kid's journal to know what's going on. That's, that's me. Um, and that's part of why I, I do speak about this is because I'm the mom that everybody said, nothing will ever happen to your kid because you are so involved in everything. Oh, um, you're so nosy. Why do you not give her any freedom? Why are you un involved in everything? If it could happen to her right under my nose, it can happen, you know, to a lot of kids. Um, so Tina, so let me ask a quick question before I just want to make sure I'm following. So seventh grade, her relationship with this teacher introduction to this teacher um, began. That's when we think the grooming happened is when he started giving her special privileges, making it seem like she was very special, that it was an honor to be able to come into his classroom. From what I understand, there was nothing physical that happened until eighth grade. Okay. So eight, so seventh grade, we're looking at like a 12 year old girl around that age. Um, eighth grade is when their relationship actually to, went to the next level and there was yes. actual contact. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and a very can, inappropriate, um, I think conversations um, definitely an emotional bond had been created, um, but there also was physical contact at that point as well. And when you say emotional bond, I mean, it's, it's not two way. It's, I mean, I, I, when you think of a, a young child that's groomed, I mean, they're groomed 
really to just do what the predator wants, but I, I don't know that the predator has really formed any attachment to the child. No, yeah, exactly. You're right. He didn't have any attachment. She felt that he truly loved her. Oh. She truly loved him. Um, she had a whole life that she could see with this person based on what he had told her. Um, although, you know, of course, today he denies everything and anything. So by ninth grade, this relationship's continued. She's in high school. And this is where you intervene. You find the Gmail account um, yes. and force, you know, basically shed light on something she's not supposed to be engaged in. And, and the thought of no longer being with him or able to access him caused her to, to self-cut. And, you know, we don't know what her intent was, but it was a very, very, you know. Yes. Yeah, she could have ended her life right then and there yeah. if she had hit the wrong yes. artery. Um, at that point, she says she did what she did because she didn't want him getting in trouble. She was afraid that I would get him in trouble for the way he had been um, and that con their relationship if I found out. And so this was her way of distracting me, according to her, um, uh -huh. and being able to get my focus somewhere else. Um, although, you know, at the end, it did just the opposite. Tina, do you feel like it's easy for, and you know, this is you, although unrelated to your daughter's story, your, your area of work is in, in the protection of children really at school and, and mitigating bullying and, and spreading awareness and education. And it, it's phenomenal. Do you think though, that teachers have such easy access to our children that it's far easier for them to create a relationship with a young student um, under the nose of a family member, under the nose of student uh, or, or faculty, rather, in administration? Is it easier than we think? I believe so. Um, I'm a very sus suspicious person by nature, and I never had any suspicions that there was anything going on that was wrong. Um, I grew up with a lot of respect for teachers, and I demanded that my child had respect for teachers. And so I never in a million years thought that this person would do anything that was not in her best interest. Mm -hmm. um, it never crossed my mind. And so I warn parents today of tell the school you want to be made aware anytime your child is pulled out of regular classroom instruction. You want to know each and every time. So you can start to see if there's a pattern. I was not made aware that my daughter was not in class, that she was being pulled out by him as often as she was. Um, and so I tell parents, you have a right to, to know where your child is during the school day. You have a right to know if they're in class or if they're meeting with someone else. And you need to demand that um, so that you know what your child is doing and be vigilant. If you see a teacher that's being overly friendly, step in step in and start doing some investigating to figure out why. Nine times out of 10, they're just a really good hearted person. That's why they're in teaching anyway. Um, but there are those few instances that their heart is not in the right place. And it is such a hard conversation to have because you know we're one of those, like you, we love our teachers. Um, they do such tremendous work. They're, they're nurturing, they're they're investing in the education of our children. They're buying classroom materials on their out of their own paychecks. We're, you know, tasking them to protect our kids in active shooting situation. I mean, yes. we're seeing so much of our teachers across this country. And then COVID's come and they, they've just been on the front lines of so much. But yet there are a few. We were talking, you and I, about this statistic from 2019. 7% of 8th to 12th grade students experience unwanted, inappropriate touching from teachers. 7%, one would say, what does that number mean? That's 3.5 million students nationwide when considering all misconduct of a sexual nature, which could include sexual um, chatting and, and photo exchanges, et cetera. That number rises to 4.5 million. And that's just kids 8th eight, eight to 11th grade. Those numbers are staggering, but are they shocking to you? Sadly, no. They would have been years ago. Today, they're not, um, because I talk to so many parents who have experienced something similar. Um, 
it's sad. I think that we don't talk to parents and educate them through the schools that, hey, this is what you should be looking for. We're doing our very best as the, the school and the administration to protect your children. But these are things you need to be doing, parents, to also help us protect your children. They don't ever share that statistic. They don't share anything with parents about what we should be doing to make sure that while our kids are on their campus, they're safe. Um, I have to say that when the school district found out, the school district acted quicker than I ever could have imagined. Oh, good. Um, they worked, that principal worked very hard to do right by my daughter. My daughter came through this because of some amazing teachers that stepped up and really worked and fought with me to get her to a good point. But it wasn't easy. Um, it, was a, it was a big fight with the school district. Oh, it was a fight with the school district. I thought you were saying they moved quickly to help you. At the beginning, they did. Okay. Um, they worked very quickly to help. Um, but three months later, when my daughter was ready to return to school, I needed certain accommodations because she was not ready to go back from being isolated, basically, in a very small group of, of girls to a very large high school. She needed to have a gradual reintroduction um, to deal with anxiety and with the stress that would accompany that. And when I first went to the school and I told them, hey, this is ready. Um, I need a safety plan. Um, because one, I needed to make sure that this person was not going to be allowed in the school. I needed to make sure that everyone in the school knew that this was a problem and this person was not allowed. I needed to make sure my daughter was being watched because I still was very fearful um, of her trying to do something to hurt herself. We were not out of the woods. We were simply ready to make that next step. And that next step is scary because you're not with your child or having somebody with your child 24-7. Um, and so when I said that, I was told, well, we're not sure what we can do. We're not sure if we can do that, but we'll get back to you. Excuse me? <laughs> what do you mean? This happened on your campus and you're telling me that the needs of my child, which you have the means to accommodate, you're telling me you don't know whether you can accommodate them or not? Mm -mm. That didn't sit well with me. Sadly, I think for most parents, they take the word of the district and the staff very seriously. Um, I knew better. I knew they had the capabilities and I demanded it. And I demanded it in a very strong way. Um, I got a call within the 24 hour period that I gave them to figure this out that, oh, miraculously, yes, they could help me. But even then, I was very clear that my child would not be spoken to by anyone that was not on my list, that wow. if she was not in this room um, where she was supposed to be, that I would be immediately notified of where she was and who she was talking to. Because we also had a therapy team in place that was working with her because it was very important to me that my daughter not be a victim. I needed this to be an empowering event that led her to believe she could overcome and deal with anything that she was ever faced with in her life and be able to persevere. And so I put together a team for her to be able to work towards that goal. And I needed to make sure that other people that were not part of that were not inputting other messages of victim, 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 and oh, poor baby, um, because that went against what we were trying to do. And um, I had problems. There were more than one meeting that I got up and I said, you know what? I have nothing nice that I can say right now, so I need to excuse myself, mm -hmm. and we will meet again in a week. Um, until then, my daughter will not be back at school. Um, and so we would have those conversations where they realized I was dead serious um, in what I was expecting and what I was demanding um, for my child. Because first and foremost, my job is to make sure she's safe at every moment of the day at that point. And so, so eventually things got worked out. Um, higher ups got involved in the school district and even the superintendent sat down and said, tell me what we could have done differently. Tell me if what you, we could do to help parents. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that they responded to you? And I want to go through, you know, you mentioned some very clear guidelines that parents can actually write down and, and take to their school districts right now. And I think it applies for um, uh, many different situations, but I, I guess my question is, did it apply more so in your case because criminal activity happened on the school campus? I mean, it, it, they 
in a, what happened to this teacher? You know, the school where there charges filed. I mean, he was he was released from his duties, released from his contract. There were charges filed. Um, the DA felt because of other issues that they chose after he was indicted not to pursue the charges. Um, Child Protective Services found reason to believe um, that this had happened. They made a recommendation to TEA. His license is under review. This happened four years ago, and we just now testified against him um, for his his teaching license in Texas. Texas Education Agency's attorney is the one that was fighting to have his license removed, and he He's put everything he possibly had into talking with us, learning what happened, um, talking to everybody involved. The school district's detectives did an amazing, amazing job. Um, But sadly, not everyone agrees with what you as a parent know is best for your kid. Um, You know, I have a way that I raised my daughter and I wanted to make sure that this was simply a little bump in the road that this didn't become who she was or who she is. She's so much more than that. And she's, she's overcome and she's now, you know, has the confidence to be out on her own. She has the confidence to be making decisions and moving forward in her life instead of being at home afraid. And that was our ultimate goal. Which is amazing. And so you, and you talk about a strategy really, and I want parents to hear your strategy, but also think about bullying cases and other areas of conflict in the school in the school environment where you need you as a parent must step in and advocate for your child. I mean, and I you and I talked about before. Um, you know, parents need to document everything they possibly can document. Um, file a police report if they have to. See doctors or medical staff if they have to. Report the incident to the school in writing. And this is where I want to kind of elaborate with you. You talk a lot about the need to put everything in writing, create your own action plan for yes. your t- order or demand a response within a designated time frame. So that gives you a cause of action to respond. Um, if you get a phone call, go ahead and write it in, e- in an email and say, this is what I understood on, you know, on our call today at 5 p.m. Yes. Talk, talk us through a few of those very concrete steps for parents. Well, as I tell parents all the time, you know, document, document, document create a paper trail so there's no misunderstanding of what was said or what was promised. And always create timelines because as they say, the squeaky wheel gets the grease Mm -hmm. and we want the grease. We want the school to know that we're serious and we don't have a lot of time for them to dilly dally and get something done. Um, And so what I tell parents is when you talk to the school, send that email back saying today we discussed X, Y, and Z, but always at the end of your email, say, if I am mistaken on anything that has been written in this email, please correct me within 24 hours. That way you're not constantly worried that did I say something that wasn't said? Did I process something in a different way? And the school also has put on notice that they only have a limited amount of time to correct you if you're wrong. That way they can't come back in a month and say, oh, yes, you said that, but we didn't agree. Yes. Or, oh, we didn't think that that was right. Well, if you didn't let me know, then we're not on the same page. And so this way, it makes sure that we're all on the same page all the time as we move forward together. It's also important that you reach out to other associations, other agencies that can give you information. Don't get all your information from one person or from one place. I called the Texas Education Agency. I called the U.S. Department of Education. I called and talked to different nonprofit organizations that dealt with schools, not necessarily in this capacity, but had some understanding of how the schools worked and what was required for children with special needs. Because I felt at this point in my daughter's life, she was a child with special needs. And so I contacted all of those groups and got information from all of them so I could put everything together when I made my ask. And I was very clear in my ask. And I didn't ask just to be asking. I had a very specific reason why. And I laid that out for them is I need this because of this. I need this because of this. And I made sure they understood that this was not a stagnant plan. This was a plan that had its own life and it would be constantly evolving 
as we saw my daughter making progress, as things were happening, we would be tweaking the plan based on what her therapeutic team felt was necessary. And that's one thing I, I cannot preach enough to parents is as much as we think we know our children inside and out and we can help them with anything, therapy is a must when our child have ex has experienced any trauma. Because what I learned too is even though my daughter and I could talk about anything, she didn't want to share everything with me because she didn't want to upset me. Mm -hmm. She didn't want to disappoint me. And so she was able to have those conversations with a therapist and be able to process and they could help her process how she was developmentally able. I'm not trained that way. I'm a mama. I'm not mm -hmm. trained in therapy. Um, and so that was definitely the best thing we could have done was get therapy. But I also, in other situations, I also advise parents to take a step back. When things are happening, we want revenge. Yeah. Oops. You want revenge because somebody harmed our child. But in all situations, we're not doing the best for our children. Mm -hmm. um, I deal, you know, I talk to parents who have had a child be bullied on the playground by somebody that had been their friend since they were in, you know, preschool. So most of their life, they've been friends with this family. And now they're this child bullied my child. They did wrong. I want to go, you know, all out. I want to get a lawyer involved. I want a temporary restraining order. And sometimes I have to say, you know, let's take a breath and really think, is that best for our child? Or is there another approach that will help them be able to have a more productive, happier life? Sometimes what we as parents want to do is going to make the road more difficult for our children. And so sometimes, you know, it's That's important. A huge point. Because oftentimes parents in a position like this, we're responding from emotion, from this overwhelming desire to protect our children. Um, and as you said, it, that's the, you know, you are also dealing with a desire to get revenge. I think that is one of the most difficult things a parent must navigate. And, and if that comes into play with a school that doesn't have a roadmap, that doesn't know what they're supposed to do when faced with a situation like this, you can imagine how that friction escalates. It does very quickly, very quickly. And the school, we have to remember, the school has a duty to both children or both parties. They have to be impartial. They have to look at what's best in the overall situation. And oftentimes as parents, we look at that as they're not advocating for our child like they oh, should. Right. And then sometimes they're not. But in other times, if we would stop and allow them to explain why they are presenting a certain course of action, and we let that kind of percolate for a few days, we start to see the reasoning. And that happened in my case as well. There were a few instances where I had a teacher who would come to me and say, you know, I would love for you to think about this. And we would talk about it. And I tell them, I'm very uncomfortable with that. That's really going outside of my comfort zone. Tell me why you believe that way. And they would talk to me and they would share with me their thoughts. And I tell them, you know what? I can't make a decision right now because one thing I learned is although I am great at making quick decisions during this process, that was my worst enemy. I could not. I had to make sure I let everything settle and I was calm and I looked at all the facts and took emotion out of the way. That's um, amazing. Actually. And so I recommend that for all parents. As hard as it is, we need to take our emotion out and really look at what in the long run is best for our child. Tina, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned the fact that your your daughter had mentioned that she had a crush on this teacher, um, that she had a journal where she said that she loved him. Did in during the investigation phase when people didn't know for sure had they had an actual relationship, a physical relationship. And it sounds like it, that relationship was taking place on school grounds. Yes, it did. And maybe I'm not right. Okay. No, you're um, correct because I never allowed her to stay after school. I never allowed her to go anywhere where he would have been otherwise. So yes, everything happened at school. So while that was, so until they were certain of that, was, was there any part in this where they were saying, you know what, Tina, she's just a girl with a crush on her teacher. Um, he's a, he's a great teacher, a well-liked teacher. We don't know that anything happened 
between them? I mean, you mentioned the fact that the school has to do their due diligence and almost represent both parties, but was there a season or a time when they were really looking at the teacher and sort of, you know, advocating for his defense as opposed to your daughter having gone through something so traumatic? I do not feel that they did ever. Okay, I good. feel that they advocated and were protective of my daughter from the very moment and protective of all the children on campus from the moment I brought these this email password and login to the principal. Before he ever had time to read anything, he put the children first and brought that teacher in. And I, I constantly say that he was a blessing to us because I hear other people talk about similar things and that's not their experience. Um, we found the school district never said, ah, hmm, let us look, no. They listened and they were very concerned about doing right by not only my daughter, but the children who were still there at the school. Did they find that he had done this with other students? I believe there were allegations. I don't believe there's any proof. Okay. Okay. And honestly, I tried to stay out of all of that um, because I tried to stay very focused on what was best for my daughter. Mm -hmm. And even though it was one of the most difficult things in my life, I tried to stay out of the investigation and the way and anything the district was doing regarding this, this gentleman. Um, the only time I did step in is at one point there, he had been told he could not be on any of their campuses or at any school events. And I knew he had a daughter. And so I did say, mm -hmm. if he's going to something to support his child, if I can be made aware, I will make sure my daughter's not there wow. because I did not want his daughter suffering because her father was who he was, it wasn't her fault. And in my eyes, I expected that to be the last year that he could ever do anything with his daughter um, because I expected him to be in jail. That's not what happened. Um, but I also was trying very hard to look at this from the perspective of his children um, and be fair to them and not judge, you know, not make them responsible for things that someone else had done. As you've walked through this journey personally and done so much in the four years since this happened, um, you know, you give such concrete, and this is why I, I really, I so enjoy talking to you and I really wanted you on the podcast because I think parents sometimes need concrete, I believe parents actually always need concrete steps during very emotionally taxing situations that involve a school district that's overwhelming, that's intimidating, that where there's gray areas where we're not sure what the law is, what our rights are. You've been so good about creating these concrete steps. Do you have a template or a resource center or a place where you send um, families that might be going through the same thing? Actually, we send, we send them to you, um, yes. either to you um, to be able to get those helps from advocates. Um, we send them to David's Legacy Foundation, which works with bullying and cyberbullying. Um, I'll send some parents to the Rape Crisis Center, depending on what has happened. Um, normally, I'll sit down with them and try to help them map something out on their own um, so that they feel ownership and they feel confident in what they're doing, um, just so that they have they feel like they're being listened to. Because I think most of the time, and what I tell school administrators all the time, is parents don't feel like they're being fully listened to and that yes. you're understanding what's really going on within their family and how they're suffering. And so by you putting up what we perceive as roadblocks, you begin to create a divide between us where it's us versus you. And when you put a mom and a dad in that situation, they're going to do everything they can to take care of their child. It's not the way it should be. And so I think schools are getting better. Um, mm -hmm. I have superintendents who have reached out to me over the years and said, hey, tell me what we can do. Tell me how we could approach this differently. What should what could have happened that would have made you feel like your daughter was truly being cared for when she returned? And so I've talked with schools about that and about being more of the process from the time something horrible happens until the child's back on school, the school campus. Um, there should be communication 
Um, it shouldn't all stop because that child is getting help somewhere else. There should be that guidance for the, the parent. The parent should have a liaison at the school who's their advocate who can help them understand what's next so that they don't feel alone and they don't feel like they're fighting the system, that they feel like the school system is standing next to them and paving the way. And that's what we need to do. And there were there were teachers, there were principals, there were people all along our path that tried so hard. But at the beginning, you could tell this was just not something they were accustomed to dealing with. Yeah. They, they didn't have a process in place to be able to deal with me. Um, and some of my requests, you could tell there wasn't a hierarchy of people getting information. And so, again, that communication is key. And so I tell parents all the time, never hesitate to carbon copy every one of your children's teachers on a note that you're sending to a principal. Make sure if you ever, ever, ever feel that your child is fragile emotionally, send that note to your teachers. Send that note to your school counselor on your own. You don't need an assistant principal or a principal to do it for you. You can send that note and say, hey, this is what's going on in our family right now, or this is what's going on with my kiddo. You are the person that has eyes on him during the day. If he's not in your class, or if you see him leaving more often, or you see a change in behavior, please escort him to the nurse's office or escort him to the school counselor. You can ask a school counselor to do a welfare check. And that's what they're there for. And they're always very responsive. Um, but teachers can't do anything if we don't let them know what's happening. And too often I hear parents say, well, I don't want to include anybody in our family business because something that their child's going through may not have anything to do with school. It may have to do with a crisis within the family. But again, if teachers don't know they need to have special eyes on your child, then they're not going to because they have their eyes on 10 other children that have special needs. Yes. So it's up to us as parents to draw their attention to our kid and say, hey, we need you to shine a light over here for a few days. This is what's going on. And I found the teachers that we were blessed with, they were amazing. They got us where we are today and ensured that my daughter saw herself as a powerful female who, yes, did she make some mistakes? You bet. Did she do some things that maybe weren't in her best interest? Oh, yes. But that did not define her. And it certainly wasn't going to be her path. If anything, it made her stronger and it made her realize, you know what? Today may be horrid and I may not see that there's any light tomorrow. But you know what? Something's going to happen tomorrow. And as my daughter will tell you, even if it just meant you got me a brownie, something was going to happen that I liked. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be a grandiose thing. It can be a small thing, but gives them something to look forward to. And Tina, I think your daughter's experience helped define a pathway for so many other families. Because again, the way you've put concrete steps in place, helped the parents navigate um, a really difficult time with the school, but I think also helped the school shape policy and procedures. And that's what we need more of. So we thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for you. If viewers wanted to get in touch with you, um, we will share your contact information if you allow it. But, you know, we will also share your pointers and, and create a roadmap for families that um, may be going through this as well. Tina, we thank you so much. Sure. For and I will, yeah, I'll make sure you have that contact information if, if people need help or they need to even talk about something um, I found just sitting actually in the therapy center, um, I would listen to families and you'd hear that, wait a minute, that's not exactly right. You have a right to this or that. And um, being me, of course, I felt the need to open my mouth and to say, whoa, 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 you have a right to ask for this. You have a right to ask for that. Um, and so I, I met a lot of wonderful people and a lot of wonderful kids that had gone through an amazing trauma, but came out stronger for it. Um, and so, you know, it takes all of us to advocate for our children. I just, I think it's wonderful that you're shining a light on the fact that this does happen. And you think about that percentage, how many children are suffering this in our schools right here in Texas, right in our own backyard every day. Um, yet it's not something we ever warn parents about through the schools. And so you being able to shine a light, I think will open a lot of parents' eyes to make sure that they're paying a little more attention and they're not quite as trusting as I was. Well, Tina Stanley, we thank you so much. 
for spending time on the Balanced Voice podcast. We look forward to seeing you again and we'll connect our viewers to you. We want to stay in touch. And to everybody who joined us today, thank you. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, rate the podcast, share the podcast, um, and we'll see you all next week. Thank you so much. Thanks for tuning in to today's Balanced Conversation. You can find real solutions and tangible resources in our show notes at thebalancevoicepodcast.com. To join the conversation, follow us on Instagram at thebalancevoicepodcast and on Twitter at balancevoice underscore. Stay up to date on Renya's work by following her at The Renya Report. And we can't wait to see you next week for another Balanced Conversation.